abide us now broken down in Jesus and though we are still different he makes us one one better than another we all need faith in Jesus for all he can save us he makes us one we are yours we belong every daughter every son we are one where the family are found the gentle
Good, glorious spring morning to you. I am trusting your phones automatically updated your clocks and started your day one hour ahead. Now, to go around and change the oven, microwave, wall, and car clocks. Okay, maybe not the car clocks. They can be a little complicated. I realize that this has been a difficult year. But don't the signs of spring, the sunshine, chirping of the birds, and the rollout of the vaccine seem like the light at the end of what has been a long, dark tunnel? I am certainly feeling more hopeful. I am hopeful that we will all be able to gather together for our Sunday celebrations soon. Currently, we are meeting online, and I thank you for joining us today. We are also gathering as two distanced, sanitized groups of 10 people on Sunday afternoons, one at noon and one at 2 p.m. If you would like to join us, simply send a message to our Facebook account, email us, text me, or call the church. We would love to have you join us. We have some wonderful conversations at these gatherings. For those of you who are participating in our church directory challenge, this week, I invite you to call someone whose first name starts with the same letter as your mother's first name. So, for example, my mother's name is Dorothy. So I could call Adana, Deborah, or Dorothy. Be sure to call so they can hear the sound of your sweet voice. Go ahead. Add to the joy of someone's day by being an encouragement, by being the church. Would you join me now in prayer, followed by the responsive reading that will appear on your screen? Let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Great triune God, we have gathered online in your name as an act of faith and love believing that you are not only among us, but that you love us. It is often hard to recognize your love, see your mercy, and feel your presence. Help us today that we might be transparent to your grace as you reveal yourself to each one of us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. God loves us with a steadfast love. God loves us so much. God gave us his son. God loves us with a great love, rich in mercy. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. Spring has not even sprung yet. That officially begins this coming Saturday, the 20th of March. But already the signs are all around us. Longer, brighter, warmer days. The snow giving way to grass. The first glimpses of perennials pushing through the soil. And the emails and Facebook posts about the beginning of baseball season. I noticed a neighbor posting on the Kings Court neighborhood Facebook page, letting people know that Little League was starting soon. Questions are being sent out via email regarding whether our church league softball will be happening this spring or not. With COVID, it is still too early to confirm. We used to have a Kings Court Free Methodist Church baseball team. We were called the Good News Bears. In fact, we won most sportsmen-like team in the league one year. I hope next year we will enter a team again. But this year, in the midst of COVID, we will be cautious and wait it out. With spring in the air and baseball on the minds of some, I thought that I would use baseball as a metaphor for speaking of the grace of God. Grace is a theme that runs rampant in our lectionary text this week. 
Grace is a theme that has saved and continues to sustain my life, our lives. Someone asked me just this week why I chose Christianity. I explained that I had explored and or practiced various faiths, Buddhism, Judaism, Mormonism. I even looked into Scientology. And some of these had some good teachings, some good practices. But in the end, it was grace that led me to becoming a Christian. God's grace undergirds my faith and informs the very doctrines I embrace or reject for that matter. Today, we are going to discover the four batters and four bases that make up God's grace plan for living a home run life. I would like us to consider these in the context of a baseball game where God's team is up to bat. It's the bottom of the ninth, two out, the score zero zero. The first batter steps up to the plate. The batter's name is love. Love overflows in our lectionary readings this week. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. Psalm 107.1 rings out, His steadfast love endures forever. And in Ephesians 2 verses 4 to 5 we read, Out of the great love with which he loved us. Love swings at the first pitch and hits a solid single. Love is always the start-off hitter because love never misses a pitch. Love always gets on base. Love never fails. So love makes it to first base. As John Wesley describes the order of salvation, this first base is provenient grace. It is a grace base obtained only by God's divine love. His love, which surrounds all humanity, which is present with each and every person. It is this love, God's love, that prompts our first awareness of God and enables our desire to seek forgiveness and to choose to walk in God's will and ways. The word provenient means to proceed or to go before. The love of God goes before us and makes a way for us to respond to God's invitation to relationship. Without the love of God, we could never get to first base. Without provenient grace, we could never love God. As explained in 1 John 4.19, we can love God because God first loved us. Preceding grace is God's drawing of us to God's self. Jesus is recorded as saying in John 12, 32, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. It is the grace of God that goes before us, exists within us, apart from anything we have done wrong or anything we can do right to earn it. And it precedes any movement of us toward God, and so towards our eternity in God's kingdom. It is a grace freely giving to all. As John 3.16 clearly says, For God so loved the world. The love of God gets every single person to the first base of provenient grace, giving everyone an opportunity to get in the game. No one has to beg or plead for God's love. God initiates and actively seeks to love all of humanity. Getting on first base, however, does not guarantee a home run life, but it does make it possible. By God's free gift of love, through God's gift of preceding grace, each and every one is given the opportunity to believe, to respond to, and to accept God's love and get in the game. To get home. So love gets us on the first base of provenient grace. The next batter named Faith readies herself at the plate. The first 
pitch is throwing. Looks like it's going to be high and outside. No, wait, it's a knuckleball, which flies straight across the plate. Steer right! Faith shakes it off. The second pitch is thrown. Straight down the line. Fastball. Steer right! Faith takes it all in stride. The pitcher winds up, lets it go, and with the crack of Faith's bat, it is a line drive up center. Faith gets a single and advances love to second base. Because as we read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. If love brings us to God's first base of provenient grace, then faith gets us to God's second base of justifying grace. Justifying grace is the grace of God that restores us into right relationship with God. It is faith responding to and receiving God's free gift of love and forgiveness. It is the love of God that forgives us for all we have done wrong and for all that we have not done right. It is the love of God that welcomes us into the family of God. This justifying grace is made possible by faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Paul wrote in Romans 5, verse 8, But God proves his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We cannot earn second base by our good works, or by cleaning ourselves up, or getting our lives together. No, second base is a grace base that is only achieved through faith by trusting in Christ for the forgiveness and new life made possible by his death and resurrection. The words recorded by Paul in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, reminds us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. In the moment that we trust in Christ for our forgiveness and salvation, we are justified before God. We are no longer guilty of our sins. We are no longer condemned. We are now forgiven. We are free in Christ, restored into right relationship with God. Not because of what we have done, but because of our faith in what Christ has done for us. We have churned the corner and have the confidence, the assurance that we're going to make it home, having been justified by God's grace through faith. The game is not over yet, though. No team has ever won by getting their players to second base and leaving them there. There are no outs. Love and faith are on base. It's looking like God's team is going to claim the victory. But in order to do so, we can't stay where we are. The next player on God's team is up to bat. First name godly, last name wisdom, often referred to as the Holy Spirit. She gets into position, elbow up, bat readied. Temptation throws the first pitch. Godly wisdom watches it waits for it, and lets it pass. Ball one. Unforgiveness winds up for the second pitch. It looks good, almost too perfect. Wisdom considers it, but hesitates, and the ball breaks low. Ball two. Selfishness sends the third pitch high and outside. Ball three. Last pitch, thrown in by pride. Looks like a strike, but no, the umpire yells, ball four, and godly wisdom walks to first, advancing love and faith along the gray spaces. You would think Satan would clue in by now. We can see from his stat sheet that godly wisdom never swings at what the enemy throws. 
James chapter 1, verse 5 encourages us, saying, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Wisdom advances the lead runner to base three, sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is the grace of God that transforms us into who God created us to be maturing us and strengthening our ability to live as Jesus lived. It is the continuing work of the Holy Spirit in those who have experienced God's justifying grace, helping them to overcome the very things that seek to kill, steal, and destroy us. To overcome the inclinations that serve to oppress and cripple others. God's sanctifying grace allows us to be set free from our earthly enslavement to sin. While justifying grace perfectly and completely frees us from the eternal consequences of sin and restores us into right relationship with God, the sanctifying grace of God strengthens us to break the chains that leave us controlled by our sinful ways. Where the justifying grace of God says, come to me just as you are. I love you. I will forgive you. The sanctifying grace of God says, I love you too much to leave you the way you are. I have better for you. Let me lead you to more abundant life. While sin no longer controls or dominates the life of a Christ follower who has experienced the provenient and justifying and sanctifying grace of God, it is still present. I have been a follower of Christ for over 20 years now, and by God's grace, I have turned away from many of the choices and practices that were crippling me, that were hurting others. But I have to confess, I still struggle to do what I know I should and to not do what I know I shouldn't. I still sometimes make poor choices. I still need God's grace through the power of the Holy Spirit to help me to resist temptations, to help me forgive, to help me root out bitterness, to decrease my selfishness, to decrease my pride. Without godly wisdom, without that godly wisdom that leads us to the base of sanctifying grace, we will struggle to wrestle free from the grip of those things that continue to enslave us and others. However, for those who stand on the base of God's sanctifying grace, they will experience the ongoing process of dying to their old ways of thinking and living while coming more and more alive in Christ. In Romans chapter 6, verse 11, we are encouraged, Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. It is only by God's grace that we can reject sinful living and be set free to live more abundant lives that bring blessings to the nations and flourishing to all people. Reading from the message paraphrase of Romans 6, 6 to 7, reminds us, Our old ways of life was nailed to the cross with Christ. A decisive end to that sin-miserable life. No longer captive to sin's demands. What we believe is this. If we get included in Christ's sin-conquering death, we also get included in his life-saving resurrection. Sanctifying grace is the grace of God at work in us through the power of the Holy Spirit that allows us to fulfill our mission, to be continually growing in love for God and others. A love demonstrated not simply by our words, but with our actions, with our practices. One of the major tenets of free Methodism is that faith and works are inseparable. What we say we believe must be confirmed by what we do. 
Faith inspires service. James chapter 2, verse 17 says, In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Because of what God has done for us, we offer our lives back to God in service to his mission of redemption and reconciliation of the world. The sanctifying grace and love of God compels us to love God through our acts of piety. Things like prayer, communion, worship, Bible study, fasting, the gathering together of believers. And to love others through our acts of mercy, including fighting against injustice, caring for the lonely, for the marginalized, for the overlooked and dismissed, providing for those in need, using our time, our talents, our resources to help others. Wesley puts it this way, doing all the good we can, by all the means we can, in all the ways we can, in all the places we can, at all the times we can, to all the people we can, as long as we ever can. Third base, the base of sanctifying grace is where we as committed Christ followers will want to remain until such a time as the last hitter gets up and brings us home. This base of sanctifying grace is where we will experience the most wonderful adventure, where we can grab hold of every good and perfect gift that God has prepared for us, where we can be of the best and most use for God's kingdom purposes, where we will see the most fruit developed in our lives, where we will experience the most peace, the greatest freedom, and most abundant life. The third base of sanctifying grace is where we will reflect more of the image of Christ, where we will be the biggest blessing to others, and where love of God and others will rule and fill our lives in ever-increasing measure. That last hitter is the star player of God's team. This teammate influences, encouraging, encourages, and pours into every other player. The star player's name is Grace. And with the bases loaded, the game tied 0-0, and no outs, Grace steps into the batter's box. The opposing team snickers because Grace doesn't look like much. Satan schemes and thinks to himself, this Grace has no power. If I throw it just right, we can make an easy triple play. Thinking he was about to win the game, Satan fired in his first pitch. To everyone's surprise, Grace smoked the ball over the heads of the opposing team and into the bleachers on the third deck. It was a grand slam, bringing everyone home to glory. God's glorifying grace is the grand slam for Christians, the end result of our Christian life. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. 1 Peter 5.10 we were not provided provenient grace just to respond to God's love and be justified, nor justified only to be sanctified. No, all this grace is extended to us that we may be glorified in Christ Jesus, that we who are burdened with the sin nature will instead be transformed into the wholeness of Christ fully realized in us, becoming like Jesus, perfect in spirit, perfect in body. Philippians 3, 20 to 21 reminds us, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. Not only this though, John Wesley, I believe, rightly recognized God's glorifying grace as not just changing the state of humankind, but all of God's creation. The day when all the earth, all the universe, all creation will be restored and redeemed to its perfect shalom, its perfect wholeness. While love leads us to the first base of providing grace, and faith to the second base of justifying grace, and godly wisdom, the Holy Spirit, to the third base of sanctifying grace. Only God's ultimate grace can get us home to our promised eternal future in the presence of God, a future where there will be no more sin, no more suffering, no more doubt, no more fear or anxiety, no more mental health struggles, no addictions, no lies, no racism, no prejudice, no sexism, no physical sickness, no broken relationships, no poverty, no abuse, no injustice, no greed, no hunger, no thirst, no crying, no pain, no disappointment, no need, no death. Instead, joy pure, unadulterated joy and peace in the presence of our perfectly loving and grace-filled God. Love, faith, and godly wisdom may get us on base, but they can never bring us home. Only the grace of God, which flows from God's perfect love, can do that. If love, faith, and wisdom were enough, we would be inclined to think that we won this game called life on our own. But the truth is, apart from God's grace, we will always strike out. That is precisely the beauty of God's grace plan. God offers us his love and mercy freely, no strings attached, because God wants us to have it, because God wants us to get home, to be with God, to be restored into right relationship with God now and forevermore. Would you pray with me? God of grace, we are ever so thankful that you love us and invite us to love you. Thank you that you loved us before we could even conceive of loving you and that you have made known to everyone your love. Remind us over and over again that you love us without our needing to earn it even when we feel like we do not deserve it, you love us. May your sanctifying grace help us to love others in this same way. Help us to respond to your provenient grace, to receive your love and love you in return, to allow your sanctifying grace to transform us and lead us into more abundant life and to help us love others all the more in real and tangible ways that bring blessings to the nations and flourishing to all people. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our gracious Lord and Savior. Amen. Play it out, but all of it's in your head. Holding on with both two hands, gotta let go now. Is it really you knocking at your own? Always looking for something hit more Don't be a fool Don't be a fool Oh no, no, no You just
just gotta let that old story go You just gotta let that good river flow into your heart It's a start
May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storms. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again and through our doors. broken down in Jesus and though we are still different he makes us one no one better than another we all need faith in Jesus for all he can save us he makes us one we are yours we belong every daughter Every son, we are one where the family of God, the gentle. and poor.